All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Business and Finance Fridays, live at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Every Friday, we will be tuned in to talk about business and finances on at 7 p.m. on Friday. I know there's a lot of things you guys can be doing on your Friday evening. This is one of the things that you should be doing to prosper your upcoming business ventures and just take the information we have to give you. Business and Finance Fridays are my favorite day of the week because every Friday we kind of dig in a different topic when it comes to either, you know, your business, scaling your operation, managing your finances. Um, we talk a little bit about business credit, what that looks like on the finance and accounting side. And this Friday, we actually have a guest and I'll wait for him to come on. And we'll be talking about operations, systems, and of course the finances behind operations and systems. When do we invest? When is it time to invest in our operations? And how do we know how much to start investing when? So I'm excited for today's Instagram Live on a Friday. We have a guest today and I'll wait for him to come on. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. So it's Friday. Every 7 p.m. we'll be here waiting for you guys. This Friday, I'm super excited for. Um, this is our sixth or seventh consecutive week doing these Instagram Lives. Um, and one of the most important things about these Instagram Lives is that we kind of dig deep on a different topic every Friday. Um, today's topic, we're gonna talk about managing your business, also some operations, systems, processes, all of those great cool things. Um, there are a lot of business owners new to the scene that need this information, so we're happy to have them on. Have you guys on? Let's see if I could do this little thing here. I think it works. Hey, yeah. How's it going? It's going good. It's going good. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Finance Friday. So it's definitely good to, to join you today, finally. Um, I know. Speak with, with your followers and then have my followers also engage with you too. So thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself, who you who are you, where you from, what do you do, and okay. then I'll try to do the same. All right, great. Let me get comfy here because I'm not in my office like you. I'm just in the basement. <laughs> but, uh, so for those who don't know me, my name is Kevin Dulcie. I'm the CEO of 1990 Business Consulting. Um, we've been around for about since 2018. Prior to me uh, joining, well, starting my own firm, uh, I was working with um, some larger companies, some Fortune 500 companies, some tech companies. And my decision to become an entrepreneur at the end of the day is because I was tired of not being valued um, and tired of just being a number. Um, no matter what position you hold with your company, and I served as VPs, I've served as um, presidents of companies as well, and it just wasn't enough. Um, it's nothing better than just having your own freedom um, and doing what you love to do without an issue. You know, I can, I can work from the Bahamas, or I can go to California, I can enjoy birthday parties with friends and do all these things without having the burden of um, going into my nine to five. Not saying a nine to five is terrible, but you know, for me, it wasn't something that I wanted to continue to do. Um, but for those who don't really know what 1990 does, we are a full service business consulting firm. So we do everything from business entity registration, whether you wanna register an LLC, an S Corp, uh, a nonprofit, 
a C corporation, or uh, if you want a business plan. So um, typically people are like, well, why would I really need a business plan? So um, having that business plan is pretty much the blueprint and the outline of how you want your company to be run and structured. Right. A lot of these larger conglomerate 800 pound gorilla companies like your Amazon and your Google, um, they all started with a business plan, um, especially when they wanted to scale and they wanted to grow their business. You have to map it out correctly. Um, not only do you map it out correctly with a business plan, but you also have to file your taxes correctly, too, especially if you want to scale and you want to grow your company out the right way. Um, we also specialize in trademarking, creating holding companies. I mean, just day-to-day -day operations and consulting um, with getting your business off the ground. So this That's is a awesome. great time um, for, you new, for you new entrepreneurs to just come and pick my brain, have some fun. Um, and we're just going to have a real, real down-to-earth generic conversation. Well, not generic, but um, real down-to-earth conversation about, you know, entrepreneurship, how we got started, and um, let's have some fun. Yeah, I think that's pretty dope. I think it's dope to hear your corporate background and how you transitioned from being in corporate to starting your own entrepreneurship journey. What made you ultimately decide? Was there like a breaking point or? <clears throat> that's interesting. So I used to work for this tech company. Um, I was the VP of strategic partnerships and um, investor relations. So I was doing something called capital raising and I was bringing in different type of companies like your Doritos, Mountain Dew, Hulu, Netflix, um, all for brand partnerships. And I was also bringing in investors to come in, um, help fund the company through Series A funding, right? So Series A funding is typically when you have a startup tech company. Snapchat went through it, Google went through it. It's when you're just really, really trying to scale and dump a lot of money into the company. Um, so I cap raised about $150 million in six months. Impressive. And, and, well, I wasn't, I wasn't just with myself. I was with, um, I was with some other, uh, yeah, I had an, a, another team, but I did, I did do a majority of it. Um, and now that company's valuation right now is at $5 billion as it stands pre IPO. Um, so my breaking point, <laughs> my breaking point was that I didn't even get to see 1% of the 150 that I raised. So wow. I'm like, you know what, why, why am I breaking my back for um, this company? Well, I was, I was, so how my role was, I was working through one company, which can, which consulted me directly with that company. So I had to go in, in that position. Um, and my company was supposed to pay me a certain amount. Um, it was in my contract. I was actually supposed to get equity with that company too. Um, and I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore. I was like, you know, this just doesn't make sense for me. Um, I'm stressing. I'm getting home really, really late. Like I'm doing two hours on the road to go into the office, even though I wasn't even there every day. But it was just, it just didn't make sense. I was by coastal I was in California, and I was here um, on the East Coast in Philadelphia. And it just was, it, it just didn't make any sense for me. So I had to, you know, take a step back, um, put in my resignation, and I left. And then when I left, what's funny is that the tech company actually had fired the company that, uh, <laughs> that fired my old company and then tried to hire me directly. So, oh, wow. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. And you said no to their offer. I said no to their offer because I was like, you know what? I don't think I want to work for anybody anymore. I've made my year salary in a month. Yeah. So. When, awesome. when I, like when you're first starting out your com company, I don't want everybody to just think that it's all glitter and gold, right? Because it's not. Um, thank God I had a, a good paying job at the time and I got to save a lot of money. But when I first started, I probably made like $500 <laughs> for like the first 90 days of me growing out my company, just making sure I have the right systems in place. When I mean systems mean everything when you're, when you're starting a company, I don't want anybody to think like, okay, um, I'm just going to start my company overnight and boom, like overnight success. No. Right, right. When, when people say you wasn't with me shooting in a gym, you don't know the hours that you have to go through, especially as entrepreneurs like yourself too. Like people don't know, like you're in your office right now at 710, even though you're doing, doing the live with me, you probably were working 10 minutes prior. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's just, it's just crazy. Um, and especially if you have clients on that you're bi-coastal and it's 
six o'clock their time and it's nine o'clock your time and you're still doing those calls or still, you know, handling that business over there. So it's a different yeah. And for those of you that don't know me, I'll go ahead and introduce myself now. Uh, my name is Carmen Mohan. My story is a little different than Kevin's here, but um, I am I own a tax and accounting firm currently, and that is my ba main business. I also own a tax software company, which we resell tax software, and we help new tax pros build their business. And that's something we do collectively on the side. Um, my main company is a tax and accounting firm. We've been here since 2014, so quite a little while now. Um, when I first came into the tax industry, I was 25 years old, um, and I purchased a tax franchise at 25 years old. I was working for a franchise company previously for two tax seasons, and I had some money saved. I knew I wanted to start a business venture. A, a business venture didn't really have necessarily knew what I wanted to do. Um, I met a franchisee who owned uh, about 13 lo uh, franchise locations in our area. I went, I worked for him, and then I went ahead and purchased a tax franchise. I actually have a video coming out on my YouTube this week about my whole franchise story and why purchasing a tax franchise is one of the worst mistakes you can do in this industry for you tax pros or future tax pros out there. Um, that video actually drops, I think, night or next week I'm not even sure um, and so that was my story how I came into the industry I purchased a franchise it was a really bad deal the deal went sour within three months and we then had to go mom and pop we went through I went through litigation with first the franchise office location and then I started with the partner me and my partner split the following year I went through litigation for another year with him and um, in 2017, I went fully solo, and I've been building on straight tax ever since. And we're um, a virtual tax and accounting firm, meaning we can service all 50 states. We're going to talk today about systems and processes and operations. Um, and it took a long time for us to build out a seamless process, which we now have, and we're able to help business owners all over the world kind of start, build, and scale their business um, on the finance side. Um, so that's kind of like the future of our company and where we've really been pushing it to be more of a small business advisory firm, less of a tax firm, more of a small business advisory. Um, and that's kind of where we are now. We currently have over a thousand personal tax prep clients and about all close to 300 corporate accounts. Um, they all vary with what they need from us. Um, but yeah, that's where we are today. I'm currently in my office now. Um, you don't need to come into our office to see us. We have everything set up. If you would like to schedule anything after today's live, everything's all set up. And I'm excited to be on this call, I'm ex uh, this live. I'm excited. Um, I think what I, what I like about Kevin and what he said was that the building of the systems and the operations and really getting himself off the ground because I think that's where a lot of entrepreneurs get like tied up at. They can start the corp, right? They can go to a, a firm, get a corp set up, but then what happens next? Right. How do they organize themselves next? And I think that that is a big um, gap in information with entrepreneurs and what do they do next? And so tell me a little bit about how you started developing your systems, your processes, your operations. How, what did that look like for you? Um, to be quite frank, so when I really started my business, it's okay for you to do R&D, research and development, right? See what your competitors are doing. Um, see how you can differentiate yourself from your competitors. So I was doing a lot of research with like LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer and Zen Business. All of those, all of those are my direct competitors because they register business entities, um, <clears throat> Inc. File. And I was just going off of some of their systems that they had in place, the, some of their website design. Um, their ad spend, how much they were spending on, on ads online, and then just really building out my system. So what I did do initially is I had spent money with them, right? So when you spend money with them, you're going to go in and you're going to join in a sense of purchasing to really understand their inside, the inside of their business. So I purchased like a business uh, LLC from them, right? I wanted to see their process, how long it really took. And when I did that, I was like, okay, so it, it's taking them up to 21 business days and they're charging, they're, they're saying that it's $0 to file, but at the end, it's like $1,000, right? 
Let that thing go to the topic. <laughs> like, it's crazy. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't need a binder. I don't need, you know, uh, a, a, a stamp for it. To... It was just a lot. And I was like, how can I do this where, you know, my clients are going to get this back within 7 to 14 business days? Um, how my clients don't need it to come in the mail where it can just go directly to their email because that's all they really need. Like you print it out, you go to the bank, you go open up a business bank account with your LLC EIN and operating agreement. That's what everybody really needs at the end of the day. And then I also realized that um, their companies weren't offering the operating agreement, um, the EIN, they were just offering the LLC. So I was like, if I package all of this together, then I know that my prices will wipe out everybody else. Right. Um, in terms of systems, because I was growing in last year, I did about 3000 LLCs. Um, and my prices range anywhere from $336 to $700 on the LLC side, because it all differentiates by state, as you know, so different state have different state fees. Um, and my fee on top of that is just 200 bucks. Um, the reason why I chose that specific price point was to move myself away from the competitors and it would be more of a volume game for me um, in terms of scaling when I'm ready to scale. So uh, as I was putting my systems in place, I got different CRM systems. Um, one of the CRM systems, because I always give game and I always want everybody to know what systems I put in place First, just in case. What's a, what is a CRM for those that don't know? Um, it's like a client resource management system, right? Um, so what you put in there for those who don't know is let's say it's like data capture you have your clients information um you have phone numbers email addresses uh when you call them like it's it's literally like a resource that you use just to just to help you manage your entire company in terms of your clientele right um it my my crm i use dubsado nice. so dubsado i don't know if you're familiar with dubsado herman i yeah uh, i don't specifically use it, but yes, I am familiar. Yeah, so, so I use Dubsado because Dubsado integrates um, with something called Wix. Wix is um, a website development company. Like you get to build out your website through Wix. Um, mm -hmm. And shout out to pretty much my CMO. Um, her name is Karima Williams. She's with the DreamWork PR. Uh, she definitely helped me um, implement all my systems in terms of my marketing strategy in terms of putting together my Dubsado, teaching me what I really need to see um, with growing out my company. So I will always give her a shout out. She is literally the backbone of my company and she helped me get to, to where I wanted to be. And we went to college together and to see her just grow her company out. And I think, you know, she would definitely be a good resource to, to do a Finance Friday Friday with. Um, yeah, I'd definitely her, love to connect with her. Yeah, to see her, you know, grow her business out and constantly constantly developing content um was just imperative to me especially when i'm getting my systems in place because i'm gonna need that marketing i'm gonna need um that crm system when people go to my website they can literally purchase an llc or a business plan directly on my website see the details of everything know what a, a differentiate between an llc and an s corp you really just see the outline of everything there um in terms of my calls i use uh I use, what is it, Scheduly, I yeah. believe? I so use I'm going to stop you right there and bring it back just a little bit for okay. our followers. Um, you said a lot, and I love it. So I just want to want to break it down a little bit just so we can digest it. Yeah. What I think like about what you said is developing your systems and processes. And for those of you that don't know, what he means is the back end of how they do everything, right? Mm -hmm. So from a lead, which is someone that's interested in his business, how do we convert that lead to a paid client right. from when they are a paid client how do we service that paid client from a to z from customer support from giving them the, their deliverables from even just capturing their data when he talked about crm which i believe is client relationship management tool management. it's gonna it's gonna manage the relationship when did they come into your system when was the last time we spoke to them what is all their contact information what services were they interested in and then from there, if they don't become a client, how do we retarget that client? How do we remarket to that client? And that's some of the things that he's talking about. 
his marketing program is going to his CRM is probably going to connect to some form of marketing CRM or some form of marketing generator that's mm -hmm. going to retarget that client again and again to try to get them into either another service or another sale or even just knowing more information about him and his company when they may need him again. So all of those things take different tech stacks, different tools. They also take a different system and a process. Uh, right. Now in 2021, where you guys just coming into the business world over the last few years, you guys have an advantage because there is literally a tech stack and tool for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, back in 2014, 2015, things weren't as tech savvy as they are now. So we had to really figure out how to pull numbers and set up people behind the phone to call these people one by one by one by one. and. Right. They, and things like that. So I love everything that you said about what you did. And it sounds like your operations are really put in place really well. And that, I think that's that's an amazing thing. And of course, there's also um, different areas that I can I can grow in. But just giving out some of the resources that I resources that I use, I use Dubsado, I use another platform called Flowdesk. Flowdesk is similar to MailChimp, but it's not as addy, right? So um, I pay for Dubsado, I believe I pay $39 a month. Um, and of course, that's something you can write off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> something you can write off, guys. Um, low desk, I pay about $19.99 a month, about $20 a month. But literally, they pull all of the data from my Dubsado, so emails and everything, and they put it into that flow desk. And we can create a, mail, a mailer um, to just send people direct emails or whatever the case may be, whether I'm having a sell, whether it's just like different content, seven myths on why having a LL, why, why it isn't good to have an LLC or LLC myths or something like that. Like just always developing content and just shooting it out because I don't want people to always think that, hey, I'm just trying to sell you something I want you to buy, right? You also have to educate people too, especially when you're starting a business. So this Finance Fridays that Carmen is doing now, it's also beneficial, especially as an entrepreneur, because a lot of people don't know what resources they have or um, some, some form of education. It, getting that education to continue to help grow your business out is imperative. Um, another lane that, that was very beneficial for me too, um, and it is very cheap, about $400 a month, is having a virtual assistant, okay? Yes. VA. Listen. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> having a VA in, um, in the Philippines, mind you, their English isn't too great, but their English is good enough. And you're also helping out $400 to them is like $2,000. Um, they can pay rent, they can eat, they can do whatever, but literally I record my videos of exactly what I need done. And they file my LLCs for me. Now, what am I doing? Now I can just focus on content and scaling my business and focus on other business uh, ventures that I have. So 1990 is under my holding company, 1990 Holdings, right? Um, under 1990 Holdings, I have 1990 Business Consulting, 1990 Logistics, 1990 Management Consulting, as well as 1990 Healthcare, which is a home health company that, that, I, that I'm um, starting, right? So it's different lanes and platforms that I have but all underneath that holding company. And of course you can tell people the benefit of having a holding company and a holding company is exactly what they say that it is. It is to hold the, the subsidiary businesses underneath you and it is beneficial, especially with um, tax advantages. And I am not a tax professional. That's why we have her on the phone uh, yeah. on, on the live to explain it to you. But um, And one of the main tax advantages of that holding company is going to be that you can loan money from your holding company to one of your subsidiaries, and now you've made yourself a bank. So mm -hmm. let's say his 1990 holding company, now he wants to start a home care. His 1990 holding company can loan 1990 uh, home care a loan of $50,000 for his startup fee. 1990 home care will then have to owe 1990 holdings $50,000 plus, let's say, an interest rate of 12%. That interest rate is going to be common. It's a common interest rate number when we talk about business funding and lines of credit. The bank, if I went to Bank of America, they may give me a line of credit for a rate between 8 and 16%. So mm -hmm. we meet in the middle. We chose the bank to now have a 12%. Hey, guess what? They're going to owe 
that fifty thousand dollars plus nineteen ninety holdings is going to get that additional interest right. uh, of somewhat revenue to be paid back to the holding company. As for the IRS, that is one hundred percent legally. And also, guess what? The the tax year that nineteen ninety holdings pays out that loan, that's going to be removed from their taxable income because it was reinvested and loaned out right. um, from that in that tax year. Also, when 1990 pays back, home care pays back 1990 holdings, there'll also be another write-off in the, in the virtual, in the, the opposite way. So that's what is a main benefit because you now make yourself the bank or 1990 holdings made himself the bank and he was able to distribute funds, grow his businesses, reinvest in another business while still getting the tax benefit portion of it. Um, and I think that's the best way to kind of structure all of your entities as you're starting to scale and be more of a serial entrepreneur. And this right. is kind of like the game that the wealthy play, right? They mm -hmm. learn how to make themselves the bank, uh, minimize their taxes as much as they can, use the bank's money as much as they can, and so on and so forth, and keep doing it and keep doing it on different levels. 1990 may give um, their whole, let's say 1990 only had 50% in profit. 1990 right is allowed to give 50% of profits to home care, have a zero tax bill, and guess what? 1990 also has a $100,000 credit, line of credit, Bank of America can pull the $100,000, reinvest in his company, still operate, and still probably at a zero tax rate, because by the time he earns back the $100,000 and pays it back to the line of credit, he still is, quote, unquote, may, not, may or may not be profitable, depending on what his revenue looks like. Right. So that's a whole lot of money to be distributed, $150,000 to be exact, and we just positioned it where we now have a zero tax rate. And so I think that now when business owners get the exposure to learning how to really position themselves and move money around, like the wealthy and 100% legal, as per the IRS, that is 100% a legal route to move your funds. And as long as the documentation is in place, then you are 100% audit proof as well so so guys what she just said was so important and, and a good example of that is amazon right amazon profited 13 billion dollars but they paid <laughs> zero dollars in taxes and everybody's like what in the world how is that even possible because amazon has a holding company and amazon has other subsidiaries underneath it amazon is just one arm um it's just one arm of of their of their holding company so that's how they didn't have to pay the tax bill. Same thing with Google. Google has Alphabet. Alphabet is their holding company. Um, and then you have Google Robotics and, and all the other subsidiaries underneath there. So it's, it's definitely a game that the wealthy play. And we're not even going to get into the whole trust thing because once you get into the, the trust in the states game, um, <laughs> America wasn't built for employees. It was built for employers. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's what I that's what I love telling people like it's 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 just the truth that's how it, that's a, that it's just a game changer right um a good example of that right there's something called hidden hidden states especially with LLCs right so you have hidden states like Nevada uh Wyoming Delaware and New Mexico that's where they don't have to really see who the owner of the LLC is right so I met this guy uh, in California, in Santa Monica, and we had dinner with him. He was from Egypt. Um, and he was pretty much telling us, he was like, man, he told us this whole story, how he came to America with zero dollars, and then um, yeah, how he made his money. He was like, I made uh, a million dollars a hundred times already. Like, I've, I've done it, or whatever. So he's telling his story, and then he owns this um, condo building on Santa Monica Pier near the Fairmount hotel if anybody's familiar if anybody's on the um, west coast and know the area so he's like yeah you know i own 55 percent of the building and i'm like i thought you own the entire building he was like i do i own majority but i started selling them off i was like what do you mean he was like well um some of the condos in the building are owned by different trusts that i have some of them are owned by wyoming llc's that i have and um, some of them are owned by Delaware LLCs that I have. And I was like, well, why did you do that? Because I'm just educating myself here at, at this point. I'm asking as many questions as possible. And he's like, the reason why I did that is all tax advantages. Who wants to pay a $140,000 tax bill at the end of the year? Nobody. <laughs> um, they want to keep all their profits in their, in their hands. So 
when you when you set up different entities like that or set up different trusts like that, you'll always get away with robbing the bank and robbing the government. But it's not technically robbing the government. Is be is they're not technically robbing the government is because they set up um, the system where businesses don't have to pay money back. Right, and how they do that is they're loaning out to a new business. His other business venture maybe um, also have its own expenses. And so that's where it's going to minimize his tax liability on that money. If he loaned out, the same with the 1990 example, if he loaned out, you know, $100,000 and now that new company is using that $100,000 to survive, to operate, and to grow its company, then it's it's saving the tax shelter, but the money is still working for him because it's still being um, reinvested back into the company. And so it's just a matter of strategizing, understanding tax law, and setting up your entities correctly to be able to have the documentation on the back end. So in case the IRS does come knocking at your door, what exactly are you going to say? What is the reasoning for moving this cash and for X, Y, and Z? And where is the paperwork trail behind that? And what is it going to show us? Is the paperwork trail going to show that you're completely set up? Guess what? If that first initial holding company, if you did it on yourself on LegalZoom, it may not be set up uh, exactly how it needs to be set up to right. be able to be the parent of the new company. So if that one little typo in the very beginning where you set up could hurt you in the long run where now you're ready to start playing with hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's all a matter of paperwork and working with the right professionals as well because even on the tax side of things, your paperwork, your finances all have to be in order to make sure you are paying the minimal amount of taxes, but also getting the maximum amount of advantages in growing your wealth. You know, right now, LLC Twitter, they love to tell you how, they love to tell you guys how much to expense off of your businesses. But one thing as a tax accountant I see so often is you guys don't want to claim any of your income. So you guys now have all of these write-offs, all of this stuff that you're taking off personally off your business, but you don't have an exact a a amount for what is your business even netting. What is right. your real profit margin? If you expense all of your personal expenses under your business, do you know what your real gross revenue is? Do you know what your real amount of expenses are? And do you know what your real amount of net profit is? I did a business discovery call with a woman that owns a beauty salon and she's actually pretty really successful beauty salon, beauty hair care. And she had this whole different sources of revenue, but right. she was, everything was so co uh, commingled that she couldn't give me an exact number for what all her income sources were bringing in. If you don't have an exact number of these things, it's going to be very hard for you to position yourself to scale for quite a few different reasons. For instance, if she's spending, let's say, $50,000 a year on hair care expenses, and now she has her accounting in place, we can um, tell her, hey, you're spending $50,000 a year on hair care. She now has a number. She can go look for another manufacturer or another wholesale distributor, right. tell her wholesale distributor, I'm spending $50,000 a year in, in hair products at this quality, send me some samples, now can sample three different um, different wholesalers, and now she can minimize her expenses of $50,000 a year. Let's say she finds a great wholesaler for $35,000 a year. Without knowing that original $50,000 number and the original unit count of her volumes and all of that data that came from her accounting, without knowing that, how could she re-strategize how to minimize that expense? She wouldn't need to know those original numbers to position herself to be able to do that. And so while I want us to keep in mind, yes, there are a lot of tax benefits when we do run our own companies from our home and we can expense all these additional things, there's a time and a place where your profits are overseeding and now you have higher tax bills. That's when we can start to shelter more of your expenses. But if you guys aren't even profitable yet and you're asking your accountant, how do I get a G-Wagon under my business, but you're not profitable yet, you're not really heading in the right direction. You're looking to spend more versus reinvest more into your company. And that's what I want our entrepreneurs that are first generation entrepreneurs that we tend to be heavier spenders than our, you know, than our peers. Um, and so that's what I kind of want the business owners to really take into account. Let's strategize and set ourselves up for success. Um, or even the business credit and the business funding thing. There is a time and a place. If, your, if your business has a success rate already, you've already learned to generate sales, 
then you get your business finances in order, I think that's a great time to start building up your credit. A lot of people open up their business, they want to build their credit right away, and you can with small vendor accounts, but not with getting a credit card with a $10,000 limit, and now you just want to buy all of these things within your business, you're not managing your finances, and you're not really even having full control or getting them organized. If right. you guys had your finances organized first, then built your business credit, you got two years of maturity, now you're open to business funding and lines of credit, that's a better play on strategy because now you're profitable, you have X amount of months showing a profit, and now you can, um, you can start to supersede and, and maximize your expenses to minimize your tax liability. Right. And just to piggyback off of the, the business credit side of things, um, systems doesn't only mean um, just systems for your business. It also means with yourself and your personal finances, too. Right. So people always say, like, hey, I want to get business credit. And once I get business credit, yeah, I want to buy a G-Wagon or, <laughs> yeah, I want to have like twenty, thirty thousand dollars in business credit. But you can't obtain business credit unless you have a 680 personal credit score. So I know a lot of people are coming into becoming entrepreneurs, but they don't understand that for you to be really, really, really successful, your personal credit score has to be good. It, it just has to be like you're, you're not going to be able to scale the way that you want to scale. You're not going to be able to get any business funding. Um, yes, the SBA just dumped out a, a crap ton of money for businesses, but you at least needed a 620 credit score to even get any of that funding. Um, and some people didn't even have that. So right. just when you're when you're starting your business, also make sure you're focusing on your personal finances to learning how to not commingle funds and using your business bank account for personal personal um, purchases. Um, if you're going to pay yourself out, do it the right way. Um, oh, get a paychex account, uh, uh, what an ADP and, and pay yourself as the CEO. There's nothing wrong with that. The best way you can do that is opening up an S corporation, um, which makes it easier. Uh, when right. you're going in that direction. So those are also systems um, that you need to make sure that you have in order, especially when becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and just to really piggyback what off Carmen said with with doing so and in, 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 um, getting everything in the right stature for you to move forward and to scale your business the right way. Yeah, and we definitely want you guys to take this advice into consideration. There's a lot of advice on the internet right now, and a lot of it isn't fully 100% right. Um, you can you can elect your LLC to be an S corp, yes, one hundred percent. But a lot of people will preach to you on the internet to do so, and um, they're not necessarily even letting you guys know. When you guys become an S corp, you have to, under IRS law, pay yourself a salary. Yep. So you're not just able to minimize your self employment tax and then not pay yourself a salary. You're minimizing and taking away your self employment tax. Yes. But now you have to start paying yourself a salary and paying yourself a salary means paying out payroll taxes. And so that's going to look a lot different. If a business owner wants to pay themselves um, $1,000 a week, that $1,000 including, you know, FICA, which is the payroll taxes, including those additional taxes from the business owner's account, there's not going to be a $1,000 deduction. It's going to be like thirteen seventy five. Yep. Every time. So they're going to be an extra $375 that needs to get accounted for every weekly check. So it's not that you're, it is, it, it works out better depending on your tax situation because everyone has a different tax situation. Mm -hmm. Your household status, what type of credits, what type of income right. you already earn, and what type of taxes you pay throughout the year. All of those things come into play when we start talking about tax rates. But we know that LLC is always going to have the, that additional 15% tax rate, 15.3, I believe it is. And so you could save that 15.3%, but also keep in mind that when paying yourself a salary, there are going to be additional expenses that come in, like those payroll taxes. So that has to be accounted for, which is why working with an accountant is so important, because they're going to not only educate you, but let's figure out what a decent salary is for you, right? Let's figure out what that looks like. And a good rule of thumb is if you're going to have a business, you don't want to be 30%. You don't want to be over 30% in payroll costs. Yep. Anything over 30% of your total yearly gross revenue is start, it's considered high payroll costs. So you want to figure out annually, if I make $100,000, my payroll costs should be lingering at and max out at $30,000. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you definitely want to take that in. That's a good uh, sweet spot. It's not going to be the same for every business owner. Some are more profitable than others. But when you when you start thinking about payroll, you know, um, you definitely want to make sure you're paying out in payrolls and you start getting ready to hire people. You want to make sure your percentages match up. And that all that information for figuring out what are going to be your budgets for your salary, for yourself, for your um, employees you're looking on taking on, that's going to be based on a percentage scale for whatever your total revenue is. That's why accounting is so important because it gives us all the data to be able to create these budgets, make these moves, make these adjustments, reinvestments, all of these things, you know. Um, when you hired on your CMO, she probably was kind of costly, right? Then you had to also purchase the tech tools. Then you probably had to all together invest a couple thousand dollars. Right. And now this new system, you know, how did you know at that point you were ready to make that investment? Um... I knew I was ready to make that investment when I made my first um, five thousand dollars because okay. I know I knew my business was scaling, and since I was already in the because of my previous work experience, I already knew that okay, if I don't have the right systems in place, I'm going to crash and I'm mm -hmm. going to burn and I'm going to have a lot of upset clients because they're not getting their, their services rendered the correct way or everything's just going to be delayed. So it was more so of, all right, how can I scale it the right way? Um, and where can I go from here with getting those systems in place? Now, the systems I have in place now, um, they're great and all, but my goal isn't just to do, you know, a million dollars a year, right? Um, my goal is to just be as big as my competitors. So for example, Rocket Lawyer just... Um, they just cap raised to $255 million um, as they're growing out their company. Yeah, I want 1990 to do the same thing. I don't expect to be the CEO of my company forever, right? Um, I'm going to be the founder. I'm going to sit on my board of directors, but I expect to hire a CEO at one point when I really, really want to grow and scale the company. Yes, in the beginning, you want to be as hands-on as possible, but I'm, in, I'm a different type of entrepreneur. I'm in the business of purchasing income, right? And keeping my hands off. Cash flow is key. How much am I making this week? And I don't do it bi monthly, I do it bi weekly. What are the business ventures um, that I have going on that benefit me uh, in a way of cash flow weekly? So, of course, I have my own tax accountant um, who handles my taxes annually. Uh, I've had pretty big tax bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, had a crazy one this year uh, but at the end of the day what did I purchase or you gotta buy something is what my uh, <laughs> tax account said you need to go purchase something you need to go buy something um, just so I can have more things to write off especially like big purchases so last year I bought myself a car um, nice congratulations I, thanks so I didn't need a new car I, actually I wanted a new car I didn't need a new car um, but I ended up getting a new car last year and that was something I was able to write off um, because I bought it underneath my business. So That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, hearing your journey has been amazing. I think um, you definitely dropped a lot of gems even with using some of the tools that you currently use. Um, in my industry, under tax professionals and accountants, when they hear CRMs and they need marketing tools and tech staff, they literally cringe because in our industry, we're service providers and we're used to just operating in tax software programs. Right. Or we're used to just operating in um, client paper files, right? I, I, wanna, I can guarantee you almost 90% of accounting firms are still paperized, right? Paperized, right. if that's the word. Um, and so when they hear, see it, when accountants or tax professionals hear CRMs, they're like, it's, it's like, it's like, not common nature to them. Um, and then on top of having a CRM, now having a new marketing text uh, software that's going to be able to allow them to pull all their clients' data, repurpose the data, remarket to them. It's even more like, wait, I have to do all of that? In our industry, it's not as common. Um, and so um, I think breaking for us at Straight Tax here, I think breaking that curve of we're not like every other firm, 
We have back end very detailed systems and processes that allow us to use technology to service clients in all 50 states, um, you know, that allow us, even when we do discovery calls or business consultations, they're done on Zoom. It's recorded. It's automatically sent to them. They're then in another week, there's an automatic um, uh, email already dropped to them. Hey, how did you think? Hey, how did this? Hey, how did everything go? Then they're automatically dropped into another funnel. So just creating all of that in our industry was really hard because when I went to go look for the resources and the, hey, how to, mm -hmm. there wasn't any... On. There wasn't any guidance because um, not too many offices or tax professional offices are actually even looking to innovate their back end office the way that we've been attempting to do for the last three years. Um, and thankfully, we attempted to do it previous to co uh, COVID. It co just COVID kind of just pushed us along. So hearing everything that you've set up, I'm very familiar with. And it was even difficult within our industry because our industry is more service-based and we're used to operating in just tax softwares versus now we have to operate in a software plus a CRM plus manage this. And so sometimes um, there's people that come on board and they're like, wait, this is way too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we got to be the game changers, right? Right, right. It's, it's all part of the scaling process. So, you know, we don't, we, we don't always want to be a small business, right? That's not, we don't want to stay in that position like, okay, we're only servicing this amount of people. And there are some businesses that want to stay small businesses. Um, that's, not in the, that's not the game I want to play. Um, yeah. I'm, not saying, I'm not saying straight tax and I don't want to speak for you, but where do you see your company um, going within the next five, five, 10 years? Do you see yourself as an H&R block or like, how do you see yourself growing? So um, I do not want a franchise. I went down the franchise route when I originally purchased the office. And I, while I do think there are some pros to the franchise model, and like I said, I have a, a YouTube video coming out where I speak in depth about purchasing a tax franchise and the pros and cons. Um, there, I don't want to necessarily franchise our office. Where I see our office going is being more of a small business advisory firm. And as we grow, well, I want to be able to fulfill and live back in and purchase and resell businesses for as, you know, businesses that are not doing so well. Hey, let's bring them on, help them scale. Let them uh, assist them with being more of a let's buy your firm, either whether we're buying the small business or helping them become profitable and then being able to have an exit strategy. Right. You know, um, I first started playing my exit strategy year three when I was really taking it seriously. And I packaged up to sell to H&R Block. And I remember one year I was so over it. I was like, I'm just going to sell. And so I created my exit strategy at a defeat at the time because I was so over it. But when I when I reviewed the H&R Block package of how they were going to purchase and all of the things that I had to do to even become purchasable and then... Um, Still, they want your owner, if you're an owner operator, they want you to work for two years for them as an employee as to uh, guarantee the sale price. Then they did the purchase of the sale price in a payment form of over two years or two tax seasons or three years. I forget which one it is, but you have to be compliant with one through 10 within the two years. So just reading that gave me a lot of information for being able to set us up for an exit strategy. So where do I see straight talk going? Being more of a small business advisory firm, being able to breathe life back into businesses and helping businesses become scalable and resellable to be able to help the everyday first generation entrepreneur that didn't really know much about business. You know, everything I've learned about business was through experience. And thankfully, I have a lot of it now that I now share and drop my knowledge with other business owners that are just now coming onto the scene or have been new to the scene for the last few years. So I don't want you to feel like, especially when you were discussing the um, buyout with H&R Block, that's something that's very common with mergers and acquisitions, right? Because um, I've done it. I've done it as well. I packaged up. Uh, companies for purchase. If we're merging with somebody, if we're acquiring another company, I've, I've been part of the due diligence team um, of really just betting out if this is a good deal for our company or not to purchase. So that's typically how they do it. The owner, the CEO, you're gonna work for them. Like they, yeah. that, that's that's part of the deal. And then they'll 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 buy they'll pay you out over the course of maybe two to five years at fifteen percent or whatever the case may be, um, and they'll give you a cash um, advance up front. Um, or some equity or whatever, to, however you want to structure it with them. But 
um, there's always room for negotiation uh, within that space as well. Yeah, and I'm glad I didn't go through the sale because um, I didn't know we were going to hit the amount of growth that we ended up hitting. So I'm glad we didn't go through the sale. I actually have a firm that I'm looking at right now for purchase and um, they're looking to sell and they have about five, I want to say five or six locations. I think he downsized to five, about five locations. And the total, I believe, is 1.7 of a book of business. And so he's um, and me have been in negotiations for the last few weeks on how we would structure that deal and things like that. But just being able to, for those deals, for them to contact me and say, hey, you know, do you, do you want X, Y, and Z? Let's start talking about this deal, working this out, I think is an amazing um, venture. Um, but I don't know if I want to take on more offices versus build out my, our plan, our 10 year plan, which we have a really vivid one. <laughs> there's, there's also for, for, for a lot of the new entrepreneurs on here too, there are things that, and this isn't a knock against college because uh, I did my undergrad. I've done I think we lost your voice. Yeah, now we can hear you. Sorry, I had I had a call coming in. So there are things that, um, and this isn't a Always knock. Always gotta put it on, do not disturb. <laughs> right, right. So this isn't this isn't a, a knock against college, but there are um, things that college doesn't teach you that being an entrepreneur and starting your own business will, right? Um, and we laugh about this, and we we I have a group chat with my guys because we started our own financial company, Rock Financial, where um, we're pretty much our main goal is to become a hedge fund at some point um, and just reinvest into different companies, purchases, uh, real estate investment, um, large apartment complexes, just small single family duplexes, things like that. But there are a lot of things that these college professors, they're teaching you, but yet they've never run a successful business in their life because everything is just textbook for them. You don't learn without going through failures, especially with your business. My first 90 days when starting my business was terrible. You know what I mean? My first year, granted, I, because I had some of the knowledge that I had, um, it helped me grow and scale my company the way I wanted to scale it. But this doesn't happen overnight, guys. And I don't want people to think like, oh, yeah, this is lightning. Lightning in the bottle happens all the time. It doesn't. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of restless nights. Um, it takes a lot of tears. I don't, I don't think no blood unless you punch in a wall or something. But you're definitely going to cry. You're definitely going to cry a little bit because it is a struggle, but it's worth it at the end of the day, especially if you do it the right way. A lot of people start businesses and they don't do it. A lot of people say that, um, hey, I started a business, but they didn't register their business, right? So what does that make your, what does that make what you're doing? You're doing, you have a hobby. That's what it is. It's a hobby. It's not a business. So Make sure you go and register your business. Make sure you have an EIN number, an employee identification number. Make sure you have an operating agreement that says if you have any partners, if there's 50-50, whatever the case may be. Um, make sure after you do that, you go and open up a business checking account, right? Make sure that your credit is in order. Make sure that you have at least a 680 credit score before even applying for any type of business credit, right? Make sure you have your systems in place, CRM systems, whatever the case may be, so you can capture that data because everything right now in terms of business is about data capturing, all right? You want, you want your the, the Instagram and um, email leads, social media, it's all very pivotal to, to a successful company right now. There isn't a company out here that I don't know that does not have a, have a social media platform or isn't doing any type of ad spend in any way. You know what I mean? So definitely do those things. And then the most important thing that you can do, especially if you want to scale your company the right way, especially if you want to go after those $100,000 loans or you want to go and buy your G-Wagon or whatever the case may be, is that you have to have a good tax accountant helping you out with your business because you don't want to take a loss every single year. You're not generating any revenue and that doesn't look that that doesn't look good, especially if you're trying to get any business loans to scale your company. Right. And the IRS will deem your corporation as a hobby, which will then lead to them filing a re report with their your New York state with your uh, Department of State, whatever state you registered your business in. Sorry, and then they, 
and then they will deem your corporation inactive and that's the difference between a business that's active and inactive right. if your filings have just reported losses for let's say four consecutive years irs will deem your business a hobby and then go ahead and reach out to your state your state tax department where you started incorporated your corporation and then they will just pretty much shut down the whole corporation you may you go ahead and go try to use it and it'll be inactive further on later down the line right so so guys definitely like if you're if you're starting a new company make sure you have those systems in place make sure um that you're that you're putting together together a strategy even if you're writing a business plan and your business plan is two pages long it's still something it's still some type of blueprint um, make sure if you if you have a business plan and you're looking to really really scale your company um, and you're a larger company who's already in operation or whatever the case may be like you got stuck at a million dollar hump or hey I can't get generate over fifty thousand dollars I don't know what's the hold up sometimes you definitely do need a business plan so you can really just map out how you're gonna um, how you're gonna grow and scale your company and that's even just forecasting out um, and when I mean forecasting I mean uh, estimating what your uh, your year over year revenue is going to be, um, what your expenses are going to be and everything like that, because that's probably the most important portion of your business plan, especially if you're taking out a loan because um, you go to a bank, you go to private, you know, um, angel investors or uh, different financial institutions. When you ask for $100,000, they're going to want to break down what are those use of funds for. Um, so you want to make sure that that's in your business plan too. It's so imperative and people really don't think that it's really that important, but I'm not saying every business needs a business plan, but if you want a successful business, you need a business plan. Yeah, 100%. And for those of you just tuning in, we had a great conversation today. It will be posted on my page. You guys can tune back in in the beginning. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, our, our journeys on how we became entrepreneurs, building the back end systems and operations, what that looks like with um, creating holding companies and different strategies for how we can reinvest in other businesses using our business funds and it being 100 percent legally um, a legal use or move of funds, how to create our entities and make them banks and be able to loan out to other entities. So we dropped a lot of gems, also some of the tools that he uses within his business. And I think today was an amazing conversation. I'll open the floor up for questions if there are any, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Let me scroll up and see if there were any questions. I think I saw one a while ago. I think we can add that question box too. Oh yeah, I don't know how to do that. Meanwhile, this is like week eight. <laughs> I think it's at the bottom. I see the box. Oh, here it goes. It says no questions yet. It doesn't let oh. me add it. I know I had some on mine. Let me see. Let me scroll. Okay. Um, I had saw one. But I okay, so, so somebody asks, does your business plan help with getting funding from banks for trucking for the trucking business. Yes, so um, there's something called the SBA 7A loan. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with it, that is a specific loan from the SBA that can give you anywhere from 350 up to $5 million uh, at 4.5% that has to be paid out over uh, 20 years and your repayment doesn't start for 18 months. And you need to at least have $30,000 in deposits going into your account if you're a business. Um, they want to see all your tax statements. <laughs> and they also want to see a business plan. Do they have a 7A loan for startups? Yes, they do. So um, your business plan has to be very sturdy uh, and very um, and your, your financial layout. Um, of how much you're asking for and your forecast needs to be um, on dial with 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 the loan and uh, how much the payout's going to be. So when we mean your taxes need to be in order for your business, for you to get certain loans, this isn't you taking a loss every year, right? This is you actually reporting income because then you can get loans that pay you $350,000 for equipment or 
for um, scaling, for marketing, whatever the case may be, and then you can go and grow out your business. Um, a lot of yeah. people think that, hey, there aren't any loans out here for me, but if you if you literally put the necessary steps in place, there's a ton of money out, like a crap ton of money out here for you to get. Yes, a lot. Looks like there's a couple. What is needed to get approved for business funding just using EIN? Um, what is what is needed to get business funding, get approved for business funding? So getting approved for business funding with just your EIN, you probably are going to need a corporation. For banks, they do like to see normally a maturity of two years and to have your finances in order. Depending on what bank, um, what financial institution you tend to apply to will depend on what credentials you need and what type of paperwork you need to be submitted. Some may be operating agreements, some may be business plans, as Kevin discussed, some may be tax returns, some may just go off of your gross receipts for what you actually um, have coming in and out of the business. My first line of credit back in 2017 was with my current bank, which is TD Bank, and I was able to apply. Um, and they, they actually gave me 25% of what my annual gross um, incoming receipts were. So they were able to, they gave me a number for what I qualified for. And I was lucky that I was able to qualify for that at that time because I really needed it. But I was only able to qualify for that because I also had my all of my ducks in a row as far as just using one operating account all the income and expenses was coming out of that account plus i had tax returns plus my personal credit was already structured so i had all of the plates in the right setting in order to be able to qualify and the first time that i qualified i believe it was seventy five thousand. that was my first line of credit that i got back in 2017. that's awesome um yeah. another question we had was i recently changed my business name to avoid being in a high risk category, how can I change my NAICS code or SIC code? Um, so technically you can't change it. Um, you can't change it at all. I think you have to, unless you know more about this, Carmen, um, do you have to go through the IRS to change that? So um, to, my, to my understanding, you cannot change it. Yeah. Um, to my understanding, they want you to dissolve the company and restart a new company. You can change the entity name, the entity type as far as LLC S Corp. You can change the demographics as far as address, apply to be a foreign, if you move to another state, LLC. But you cannot change your tax code for tax purposes. They would prefer for you to dissolve the entity and restart a new one because they don't want any funds to be, com to be commingled. Um, and the reason that they want they want it to be like that is because they don't want anyone to start a business for X reason and then start operating under Y reason. So yeah. I'm pretty sure they want you to dissolve and then restart a company. Yeah, because I know a lot of people who are trying to get um, business credit right now, they put in like trucking in their business name and said they're, they have a trucking company or put investments in their business name. So they have an investment company. So that literally puts you at a high risk. Um, and your, your account will get flagged for um, being able to maximize on how much business credit you're going to be able to obtain because you're in a high-risk industry. Yes. Oh, a question came in the question box. How important is a virtual address? What if your home address was stated as your address when you made the LLC? Can you still get funding from the home address? Yes, you still can get funding from the home address, but you won't get you won't maximize on your funding from the home address. So when you when you have a virtual office or a commercial location or whatever the case may be, they actually look at you as a real business, right? Um, it, it's just it's just like having your ducks in a row. So hey, like I have an LLC and it's at my house. It's like having a high school degree, right? And then I have an LLC and I have a 1-800 number, a valid website, um, a virtual office or a physical like commercial location. It's like you having your MBA and it's like, oh yeah, we're gonna give you some money. So um, that's the best way that I can really, really describe it. If yeah, you and they, to just to add to that, and they wanna see it published, right? Yeah. So when you're gonna go for business funding and you're especially looking to get 50, 100, 150, $225,000, if you were a bank, would you give someone 
a, a loan of a quarter million dollars that doesn't have a published business, you're good. They're going to want to see you with a website and a virtual um, and a business address. Maybe you don't have to have a commercial storefront on a busy highway like we do, but that virtual address will give you an address to publish. I'm pretty sure you're not going to want to publish your home address on your website. So that's right. kind of where that additional address will come from. So you're able to publish that onto your website, onto your Google business, and that it's searchable when the banks do their due diligence, you actually look like a legitimate company as he was right. just discussing. Right. Well, all right, guys, it's 8.04. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this conversation. I will be here again next Friday. Hopefully Kevin will join us again sometime in the next couple weeks. Is there anything you want to leave us off with, Kevin? Um, first and foremost, I just want to thank you for having me. Um, it was a great conversation. So I really, really appreciate it. Hopefully when I do one of my lives, I'll have you join. Um, yeah, definitely. Well. Um, we'd love to finally meet you in person. Uh, me and my brother, typically we do uh, some conferences. We'd love to have you as a speaker. Uh, for those new entrepreneurs, um, those companies already in business, keep on striving. Keep doing everything that you need to do to make your company successful. Money comes easily, frequently, and abundantly. So as long as you have all the right systems in place, I'm positive and I'm sure that um, your business will be successful. I do have 20-minute free consultations. You could click the link in my bio to do so. If you want to register and start your business today, you can also click the link in my bio to do so. Check my website out to get some information. Um, at www.19 spelled out 990.co, not .com. Um, and I look forward to hearing from some of you. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to DM me. I'm also available, okay? Awesome. And for those of you that would like, we also do do a discovery call. It is also 20 minutes. That's the magic number. Yeah. Um, if you're looking to just ask some questions and figure out what to do with your business next, we can certainly help. If you want a business consultation where you're already kind of generating sales, but you need some more better strategy, please, that is a paid conversation where we do those for an hour. And those, I believe, are $199 on our website. Um, and then we do have bookkeeping packages and accounting packages for um, businesses that are looking to really get their finances in order and just get positioned enough to start scaling their business. Well, thank you guys for joining. Today was a great conversation. If you missed yeah. the beginning of this live, make sure you go and watch the replay. All, All right. right. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Kevin. All righty. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.